What up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of mine. Uh, appreciate you guys checking this out. If you want more of my content, like what we've been doing week to week, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'll put the links down below. Every week on Instagram, I put uh, a little little highlight video on my story of this video right here. And then on Twitter, that's kind of my uh, platform for my daily thoughts of college football, Pac-12 ball, sports in general, whatever it may be. So follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you like like what I'm doing and want more content, uh, be sure to follow me there. But this week, we're looking at USC and Colorado, a game that kind of got overshadowed by the Oregon-Washington game, rightfully so. That game was fantastic. But this Colorado-USC game could very well decide the, the Pac-12 South champion when we fast forward a month here. And uh, so a crucial win for USC. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Steven Montez, the quarterback for Colorado, was quoted saying, they knew what we were going to do. He was saying that in regards to the USC defense, knowing what the Colorado offense was going to do. I thought that was very interesting because you don't always hear a quarterback say that, but uh, the reality is I think he's spot on. You can read minds. And I'll show you why in, uh, in the upcoming footage. And then on the USC side, unfortunate news. Port Augustine's out for the season. One of my former teammates. An incredibly hard worker, gifted player, great dude. So tough to see that happen. But I want to show you guys what Clancy Pendergast, uh, USC's defensive coordinator, does with Porter Gustin, what, what Gustin's ability allows USC to do on third down with pass rush and stunts and games on the defensive line. So we'll look at both those aspects in today's episode. We're going to start with the Colorado offense side of things. And more specifically, I mentioned that Steven Montez made the comment that he felt like USC's defense knew what was coming before, uh, before the play even started. And I think there's an element of truth to that. And one aspect of that to me is because Colorado ran the same play five different times at crucial points in the game. And that play is a very unique concept. It's a concept, uh, to my football knowledge, it's really taken over the college football world the past five years. I can vividly remember the first time I saw this play. I remember thinking, Man, that's an elite design. That's, that's next level design. And it was done by none other than Peyton Manning and Wes Welker, and they would shred defenses on it. And I found the clip of the first time I remember watching this concept as a player. It was back in 2014. So let's check it out. Get down the field, Jim. Still throw underneath. That's what's open. Well, there it is underneath, Phil. Welker. It looks rather basic, right? Just kind of like a little drag play coming underneath, but. There's a lot more to it, and so I'm going to hand it off to Phil Sims and let him explain it to you guys. New England put this play in years ago. Welker comes across. The people on the right side I couldn't get to. They're blockers down the field. It's a screen, really, to the middle of the field. Years ago, New England started. Now everybody in football tries to run it. It's a concept that it's a screen play, and it might be a little different, a different look than we're used to. It's not your typical running back screen or wide receiver tunnel screen, but... Uh, it certainly falls under that category in that you're having um, receivers line up and ready to block their man downfield to create an alleyway for their teammate to run, to run down. But uh, nevertheless, it's a call that I love because oftentimes you see it in first down to get drive started, or you see it when teams are in third and long and want a low risk, but potentially high reward play. And that's exactly what you get here because it's a one progression read. If he's not there, the quarterback just burns it. But if he is there and you get your blocks lined up, this play has big play potential. We watched Peyton Manning, the sheriff, operate this play. Now let's watch Steven Montez and the Colorado Buffaloes operate this same exact play. Montez, it's a crossing Nixon, and KD Nixon. That might as well be the Denver Broncos. It's the exact same result, virtually the same look. KD Nixon catches it just like Wes Welker did and runs up the sideline for a 10-yard gain and a first down. So Colorado had success with this play early on. Why not come back to it again? Couple sacks tonight for the Trojans. That had been an issue coming in. Here's Chenault crossing the field. They've got him bottled up. He somehow breaks free. One thing I love about Darren Cheverini, Colorado's offensive coordinator, and the entire Colorado offensive staff is they're finding ways week in and week out to get the ball to LaVisca Chenault. And that's impressive because every team they're playing knows they're trying to get the ball to number two, and yet the Buffaloes are still able to do it every single week. Jack. What? Who are you supposed to pass the ball to? LaVisca Chenault. Right. Alex, when? When I come in contact with the ball. The instant you come in contact with the ball. But here, we saw the same play. And when you're in second and long, the mindset of a quarterback is get half back. Get half back, put us at third and manageable, and see what we can do. And that's exactly what they do here. A successful play call, a good gain. But 
The Trojans are over there saying, hey, man, we've seen this twice before. Let's be ready for a third time. Getting going, but forced into big time action tonight. On second down, Montez hits. This time around, USC's ready for it. They're prepared, and they stop it with a big hit. But the way they stop it is they change the picture up on Colorado. And what I mean by that is this screenplay is predicated on the fact that each receiver away from the screen side, so basically every receiver that's not LaVisca Chenault, needs to make sure that they block every USC defender downfield, or at least the defenders that are there capable of making a play. But what USC does this time is they decide to drop eight which means they have an extra guy in coverage, which means blocking responsibility-wise for Colorado, they're outmanned. And so when we look at this play and roll it again, when we look at the running back, he's going to have just himself, and he's got to block two guys, both interior linebackers, and he decides to get the innermost backer, but that leaves a USC linebacker free and able to make a tackle. I said it in the open, but this concept is especially great in third and longs, and the reason is it's low risk and potentially high reward. And what I mean by that is it's just one read for the quarterback. If it's there, great. If it's not, just burn it. And if it is there and the receiver catches the ball and all the blocks are lined up, the pass rush is not a factor. The defensive line is not a factor. You can get a big play down the sideline. So we're going to watch a play. We're third and 22. Colorado elects to come back to this same play for a fourth time. Third down 22 here. Montez hits crossing. Chanel juggled. A little pick six for the Trojans, and I know I'm not supposed to be biased, but it was done by one of my all-time favorite teammates, Jana Harris, so two years in a row for him against the Colorado Buffaloes. But how did this happen? And yes, maybe it was called one too many times and USC knew it was coming. Maybe the throw was a little hot or inaccurate, or maybe it should have been caught. But what sticks out to me is the poor blocking angles by the Colorado receivers, and what I mean by that is we, when we look on the bottom, J.D. Dixon goes to where Jana Harris is at right now, and he needs to go more to where he's going to be. He's got to know that LaVisca Chenault's coming from left to right, so the DB's going to follow in that same track. He doesn't do that, and as a result, Ejena Harris is able to slip underneath the block and be there to make the, make the pick six. If J.D. Dixon takes the right angle, Ejena Harris might not even be there to make the play. So it's not necessarily his fault, not the best throw. Maybe you could have caught that. Maybe... Maybe it was called one too many times, but uh, nevertheless, a crucial mistake for Colorado. And you can see how the fourth time around, USC knew it was coming and was there to make a big play. All night, here's the second and 15. Montez flushed out by Gustin, who's hot in pursuit, forcing the throw. There we just saw the fifth and final time Colorado ran this concept. And uh, as you guys noticed, SC kind of knew it was coming. John Houston, the SC linebacker, has extreme inside leverage, and the second LaVisca Chenault steps down to come on his little screen path, Houston jumps it. He knows it's coming. There's nothing there, and that coupled with Porter Gustin's pass rush really cripples this play from the start. I think there's some validity in Steven Montez's comments that the USC defense knew what was coming, and I think that's a credit to their players in making the adjustments as the game went on and knowing that when Colorado's behind the sticks in second and long and third and long, they're still going to try to get the ball to number two, but in what way? And this screen concept is exactly the way they want to do it. And USC made the proper adjustments to shut it down and get a pick six along the way. Let's go right back to that last play. But instead of looking at it through the Colorado offense lens, let's look at it through the USC defense lens. And what I want to point out is it's second and 15, not a running down. And therefore, USC is able to stand up Porter Gustin into the boundary. And when he's standing up into the boundary, no running back in the backfield, He's virtually going one-on-one -on -one with Colorado's left tackle, William Sherman. And Sherman knows that because Port Augustin is so strong and so fast, he can really bend the edge. And so Sherman's forced to set really deep quickly in order to prevent that. But on the flip side, Gustin knows that. And so he's mixing up his pass rush moves. And this time he takes an inside pass rush move and he's able to beat Sherman on his interior shoulder and get to Steven Montez and create some havoc. Empty it out on third and seven. Trojans bring it heat. Montez throws it. Via. This time we're going to see Gustin standing up in the boundary once again. But you need to note that it's a different defensive front. Here we're seeing a 3-4 defensive front, which puts Gustin at the linebacker position. That allows a different defensive end to come on the field and take Sherman's responsibility towards him. And so when Colorado goes an empty formation, and they only have five blockers in the game, by USC rushing the other interior linebacker, it frees up Porter Gustin to have 
nobody blocking him. And that's a scheme win by USC. That's a great job by Clancy Pendergast. And while USC didn't get to Montez on this one, you can see what would have happened and it could have been a big hit, a big play for Port Augustine hitting Steven Montez. We've seen how the twist game helped Port Augustine get to Steven Montez. Now watch the impact that Port Augustine has and the tension that's given to him, which allows his teammates to also get to Montez. First down 15, low snap, Montez picks it up. Running out of time, and he's sacked. Big sack right there by Liam Jimmins, but you can see when Porter Gustin's rolling and, he, and he's given the attention by the offensive line, it allows the other pass rushers on the defensive line to really pin their ears back and get after Montez. And so with Porter Gustin out moving forward, it'll be interesting to see if teams pay as much attention to Gustin's backup or if USC will lose a beat of their pass rush and have to make up for it elsewhere. I didn't think we did, but here we are. Montez, tuck it. There we saw Porter Gustin work on the other offensive tackle for Colorado, Frank Phillip. And this time, Phillip doesn't set wide like Sherman did. And as a result, Porter says, all right, fine. I'll rush your outside shoulder and beat you with speed. I don't got to beat you with technique or strength. I'll just beat you with speed on your outside shoulder. And that's exactly what he does here. And it looks like just a good gain by Montez as he steps up and runs with the ball. But what I want to point out is when you're only rushing three guys and Gustin's able to get to the quarterback th like that, Montez should have stepped up, and there's a receiver wide open in the slot. That's what you would ask of a guy like Steven Montez to see this receiver, and he, he misses out on a, on, on a big play, all because of Porter Gustin's pressure that USC will be missing out on moving forward. And this last clip is where it all kind of comes together. It's in the fourth quarter. There's been three quarters worth of different stunts and outside pass rush moves, inside pass rush moves, and so here... Clancy Pendergrass is going to dial it up on a third down, and he's going to say, my elite pass rusher, Porter Gustin, I'm going to set a pick for him by the interior linebacker and the defensive tackle, and he's going to loop around and get after Steven Montez. Let's take a look. Trojans bringing it. Gustin trying to run him down. Montez runs out of... I've said this before, but it's a scheme win by USC, and what makes it so hard is if you're the Colorado offensive line, it's hard for your center to engage number 47, Reuben Peters, but then also be wary enough to pass off Porter Gustin crossing three offensive linemen. So it's very hard on the Colorado offensive line. That's something that you would have to practice for in, in game plan in the week before, but you can at least see how much USC is dialing up Porter Gustin, and it'll be interesting to see moving forward, do they stay with this same scheme, or do they have to mix things up because Gustin's no longer there and there's a big personnel change. So today we looked at a screen concept for Colorado. It's a concept they love. I like the call as well, but uh, unfortunately it got away from them one time there as USC's defense was able to anticipate it and uh, create a big pick six that ultimately capped the game and uh, secured the victory for USC. And then we also looked at the impact that Porter Gustin has on this USC defense. They will certainly miss him. He was on his way to probably being a, an All-American this year, which... Uh, well-deserving for a kid that puts in a ton of work, but they're certainly going to miss him. I showed you guys how they kind of scheme to get him pass rush friendly scenarios. So USC's defense will have to pick up the slack with him gone. But nevertheless, another fun, exciting episode with you guys. Thanks for checking it out. Be sure to comment and share this video. And uh, if you want more of my content, whether it's tweets, whether it's Instagram stuff, be sure to follow the links down below. And I will see you guys here next week.